So, Berto, have you heard of Alex Jones, internet personality, TV, radio personality, Alex Jones? Do you know who that is? I don't know what you're talking about. Honestly, I'm tired of this. I think it's all a conspiracy. Can you put your shirt back on, by the way? <laughs> so I thought we would talk about the psychology of Alex Jones. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda. I like to cook hot dogs, but not too well where they get crunchy. I hate the crunchy outside. This goes out to an anonymous patron who has been asking us to do this. He's actually a $20 patron, so... Ooh. So that goes. This goes out to you. Um, now, uh, all right. So let's summarize for people who don't know who he is. Uh, let's summarize because actually, I was only peripherally aware of who he was yeah. prior to doing a mini deep dive on him. He's he's very popular among a certain group of people. So you've he, never listened to him, like concertedly? Uh, no, not concertedly. Yeah. I, I've certainly seen clips and right. whatnot. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm about a, a like before doing a mini deep dive. I was like, well, isn't he just kind of like a the the new Rush Limbaugh? Isn't he? Because he kind of looks like Limbaugh, right? He he has a he has the same kind of I don't know cadence of talk, and, and he he talks like Limbaugh dialed up to an eleven, right? <laughs> so so I just thought, oh, it's just another right wing, you know, right. sort of dude, and uh, someone who. W- like, I thought Rush Limbaugh was bad, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Anyway. Which he is. <laughs> yeah. Now, at the onset, I just want to say that I I don't want to change this. I don't want to, I don't want this to be a, a political commentary podcast sure. per se. And it actually will be made easy because Alex Jones hates all politicians. <laughs> and he, and he doesn't identify as Republican or Democrat. Right. So, it, so, you know, there's that. The other thing I want to say is that we're going to talk in summary about his life, and then at, at the end of this episode, I want to comment a bit on the psychology of, of Alex Jones in right. particular, or at least what I could say about him in this in this limited context. Um, By the way, did you ever go to a, a person's house when you were a kid, and they made you lunch, you know, the mom makes the lunch, and they give you hot dogs, and they had that, that burnt, crispy skin? No. That, Why would there be burnt crispy skin? Because they would overcook it and it would separate from the body of the hot dog and be like crispy. What you mean like on the grill? No, I don't well I don't know. They m- maybe grill or an oven, but they would overcook it. Yeah, right. It, it, cause, cause oh my god. In my, I don't know if this is just difference between where we grew up, but we always boiled hot dogs or microwaved them. Yeah, right. So so I think I don't I don't know because I just was exposed to far too many overcooked hot dogs. <laughs> I was traumatized by an overcooked hot dog. <laughs> you know, you always have these super inside jokes that only like some <laughs> listeners get. So I thought that was like an Alex Jones reference of some sort. No, no, no. That or was a, or a pickle Rick. Uh, that was me trying to fix my childhood. <laughs> interesting. Okay, so Alex Jones very popular. He's considered to be the the most popular conspiracy theorist of all time. His shows draw millions of viewers daily. His YouTube channel has over 2 million subscribers, which is actually nice. a, a lot of subscribers. And he, and he has over a billion views what? Of, of all of his various... Okay, an aggregate, right? Right. He has a, a daily four-hour show, uh, audio show, that's available on more than 60 radio stations around, uh, I'm guessing, North America. And he apparently draws about 2 million listeners each week. And he's got some hardcore followers. Right. He has two main websites, InfoWars and Prison Planet, both draw to uh, combined 4 million unique users each month, uh, which is much more than Rush Limbaugh. Okay, so let's get in. So he's, he's very popular among a, you know, sizable audience. But when you think about people who have audience, you know, he's no, he's no PewDiePie. Do you know what I mean? Right. He, he, he's no, um, what's, what are those two brothers that we were, de- yeah, the, the, the uh, oh my gosh. Paul, uh, something Paul, that's their last name, right? No. Oh, yeah. I was, wait, who, which brothers? The two, about- the two blonde kids, the one who went to Japan and. Oh, that one? Yeah. Right. Oh, I don't even what know. What brothers did you think I was talking about? Oh, you the thought I was talking about, uh, the vlog brothers. Yeah. The vlog brothers, yeah. uh, green, the green, yeah, the green brothers. brothers. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, I mean, in terms of those kinds of numbers, he, you know, Alex Jones doesn't compare to that. But he would claim he's much bigger than all of them. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, so, so he would be a forgettable radio personality or internet person if it wasn't for 
the uh, newsworthy things that he says and does, yeah. right? Yeah, he it's it's the, the only reason why he's a semi household name is because of his controversies, right? And because probably equal or more people hate him. I would say more people hate him than like him, you know. Right. And of the people who like him, they really like him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he's see the the interesting thing is I think at different times throughout his let's say like the last decade, he has drawn in people that wouldn't normally be into his insanity, but because like you said he's usually railing against anything. So it's likely that he's at some point railing against something you would like to rail against. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's had like uh, what's his face on yeah, back in the day? He's had like respectable philosophers and educators on yeah. his show, like back in the day. I, I will say, so I listened to him a lot back again, you know, a long time ago. I used to do a lot of what I would t lie to myself was research of the other side, <laughs> but it was sort of an unhealthy uh, uh, fixation with listening to stuff that made me mad. Uh -huh. And he was one of the people I would listen to. Who else would you listen oh, to? Oh, you know, uh, certainly Limbaugh. Um, uh, the Michael Medved and Michael Abrash and um, base oh Laura Ingram all the how much listening would you do like uh, there was a time there was a time where I would uh, spend hours each day like at least two hours listening just just getting enraged getting enraged and this was when I was starting to go to therapy by the way and I would I would try to pass it off as like oh no 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 I'm just you know I would tell my therapist so like, like ten years ago. Um. Yeah. Wow. Oh uh, wait. So you've a been a little longer. You've been twelve years ago. You've been aware of Alex Jones this long. Uh, Alex Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Because yeah. he didn't really enter my radar until I don't know, maybe four years ago or something. And I was not aware of him first. Like first, there was more of the Limbaugh's, all those things. But as the rise of more like electronic media stuff, because I used to listen on the radio. I used to when I drove my car. Uh, to and from hot dog work, I would listen to Medved and Limba and all those people. But uh, more in the last 10 years, more and more digital media and definitely Alex Jones came up. So t t tell, describe to me, because I've seen a little bit of his more recent stuff. So let me just tell you my impression if I was to describe his shtick or yep. the way he presents himself. And you tell me, like, you flesh it out for me more. He he does the a very he, it's almost like he's copying Rush Limbaugh in some ways or or other radio personalities like this where they 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 kind of get on a track where it's I my my guess is is that they do show prep right so he's sitting there before pressing record and and he's thinking okay you know here's this news story here's this news story and here's here's my hot take on it and this is what I'm going to say about this and then he presses record and he says okay. Have you seen the new thing on this? And then long pause. Well, it, you know, and then, you know, he'll make some points and then right. he'll, and then, but really when you just, but actually I should not say that. Actually what he does is he just says a lot of English words mm -hmm. and there's sort of a vibe you get from it where he's very angry right. or intense and upset and, and it very, escalates. and he very, he's very sure of himself. Yeah. Right. And he and he kind of gets a little frothy as he as he goes, but when you really break it down in terms of okay, if I was to bullet point what he actually is saying, there's not a lot of content. There's not a lot of bullet points here. Right. Now he he has he, he he and we'll get into like some of his actual statements that he yeah. has made. But if you just listen to an average half an hour, my guess is is that sometimes there would be nothing that you would pull from it other than he doesn't like things, you know? Well, he yeah, doesn't so like Obama or he doesn't right. like the government or he's, you know, something is amiss or, you know, something doesn't smell right about Hillary Clinton or, you know, there's, it, it but he, in the average show, I'm just saying not his, not right. the things that you, the highlights, right. I'm just saying his average screed, he, he just kind of uh, is, is just stringing people along with his vibe and his, and right. people listening to it, my guests are just like, man, I am feeling what he is right. putting down. Like a common thing that might happen is he might say, so you might have seen the latest photo from the Obamas. This is actually a pretty good impersonation. Now, I'm not here. I'm not even going to say, oh, God, because if I if you get me started, like I don't I don't want to start the things I could tell you. 
that you don't even understand that are happening as we speak. Okay, fast forward 10 minutes. He still has said nothing about the stupid photos. Right, right, right. But he's talked about all these random, like, hints of things. And, and they're like, and the aliens. Oh, oh, did I use the A word? Oh, absolutely, I use the A word. And then it escalates. And pretty soon, you're like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> but, but yeah, he, yeah. And I have to say, <laughs> and I don't know about your experience, but... I find him oddly compelling. Well, yeah, and that's why people sit there. Like me, I used to get hooked into it because I, uh, especially, um, there used to be a time where I would listen because, uh, you know, like like I said, 10 years ago, I was getting into, uh, I would watch movie. The, what's that movie about the, um, well, anyways, these little documentaries that would float on YouTube that were anti-establishment and anti-globalism stuff. And then I would like start listening. And, and some of the stuff he was talking about, like sort of made sense. He's like, you think you know what's going on, but I went to California to these secret meetings and they, and I filmed them and it's true. They meet and there's all these oligarchs and I was like, oh really? Oh, what happened? Tell me more. And then he starts pulling you into this narrative. It takes a while and then all of a sudden you start hearing, you know, after several episodes, he's also, he also believes in Atlantis, but he also believes in aliens and he believes in many kinds of aliens. But then like in one minute, he'll go from talking about like uh, cannibalistic pedophiliac monsters that are running the Senate the next minute, but it's all really like men from Mars that are trying to... And you're like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. And that's after lots of listening. You right. Know, the, the, uh, you know, I've seen, again, I've seen the highlights, but when I actually like... How did I actually get on InfoWars one time? I don't know. I think I actually, as an experiment, subscribed to the InfoWars podcast. Yeah, that's what I did. And then I just started listening to it, and I found it to be so boring because it wasn't he wasn't he wasn't saying anything <laughs> right you know it was it was just a lot of fluff you right. know and, and and i like to listen to podcasts that have some fluff and personality yeah. but actually like communicates an, an idea or two you know what i mean yes yes, yes. And, and so now I, again part of it is his which is weird because his voice sounds abrasive but it is compelling the energy he's putting out right it's, it's like it's not like my SSV voice, which, you know, can you imagine if there's listeners out there when I speak like this and they're like, oh, say more. Can you well, do Can you do a Spanish SSV, um, uh, uh, Alex Jones? Alex, okay. Um, <laughs> Has visto la foto de los Obamas? Oh, ni me dejes empezar. Las cosas que te podría decir, mamacita. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he believes in the following conspiracy theories according to the internet, and you can tell me if any. You know, this is so. So people, this is this this episode is going on YouTube as all of our episodes do, and inevitably, you know, there's going to be some comments. Uh, oh yeah, about this episode. And I just have to say, like, if you if you're into Alex Jones and you and you're even into his conspiracy theories, like, go for it. Like, I. I don't want this episode to turn into some sort of ridicule of his listeners or something. You know, right. like I, I'm sure I, I'm I'm fairly positive that the vast majority of people who like Alex Jones are harmless, nice people who are you know they right. they they have ideas that I don't I don't have you know, and as long as they're not harming anyone with their ideas, which actually happens sometimes, yeah. uh, but. But, you know, I'm sure the vast majority of them are stable human beings who, in fact, I know people who like Alex Jones and they're fine people. There's nothing that I don't agree with their politics. I don't agree with their ideas. But, you right. know, our country is full of people who disagree with each other. And as long as we're nice to each other and I don't want to propagate some sort of, uh, I don't know, aggression verbally towards towards those people. And so. So if you're listening to this and you're partial to Alex Jones, um, you know, either turn this off because I'm guessing you're not going to like this episode or stick with us and, and you know, try to have an open mind, I guess is the point. I'm, I'm trying to have an open mind about it and I, and I hope that uh, that can come across. Now, Berto, you don't have to have an open mind at all. You're the, you're the resident hot dog person. I have a closed mind. <laughs> so um, he, belie he, he believes that everything is run by the New World Order, or the NWO. Yeah or otherwise the globalists. Yeah. And which I didn't know until I started reading which about may it. not be human to begin with. Right. Uh, the end, he believes that the the new world order has been around for thousands of years since uh, Bible times. Right. He, he believes it's run by Satan himself. He believes it involves every single government around the globe. He believes every corporation is basically 
you know, working under the New World Order knowingly, not right. unknowingly. Like they knowingly are a part of the conspiracy. The the NWO will be ruled by the Antichrist, which will eventually be defeated by Jesus. So it's a whole book of revelations kind of thing. Um, a quote from Alex Jones here. Devil-worshipping pedophiles basically run the New World Order. They love death and they love killing babies, unquote. Right. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Alex Jones, you're like, wait, what? And and you might be like, that must be taken out of context. Yeah, clearly that was a joke. Yeah, no. The, he, he, if he were sitting here, he'd be like, yep, I said that, and let me tell you why. You know? yeah. And what we don't know, by the way, is, and maybe you'll go into this later, we don't know if in the quiet of night by himself, if he actually believes right. 90% of his BS. So I want to I get into that later, but let's, yeah. let's go over the facts here first. Here's another uh, sort of screed by him that I got off the internet. They've got operations so big, grabbing your kids, they CPS them right out. Child Protective Services. They're on a jet to, to one of two dozen countries, and they are slaved out. And a lot of times when they hit 25 years old, 10,000 men have had sex with them. They've had 30, 40 abortions. They've been used up in ways that are so hellish you can't even imagine. They just walk them right out, shoot them in the back of the head, and throw them in a vat of acid. That's how they roll just massive, massive murder operations, unquote. By the way, talk about, like, imagine if this was real, right? Like if this conspiracy, like to this extent was real, right? Wouldn't you want to hire someone like this to actually talk like this so that basically nothing becomes believable? Yeah. Because the, the fact of the matter is there are very, very scary and sickening human traffic operations throughout the world. Mm -hmm. But by cartoonifying it like this, then who's going to listen to any of this? Yeah, that's interesting. He believes that Prince and Justice Scalia and Princess Di were all killed in a cover-up of the New World Order. He believed Carrie Fisher was killed to boost ticket sales. He believes atheists are Satan people. He believes that Obama is literally a demon or yeah. or even the devil. Yeah. He, not not like figuratively. No, no, no. And, literally. <laughs> and Hillary is also literally a demon of, you know, there's so many things that are different from mainstream culture. One, he believes in a v very you know, medieval version of Dante's Inferno. Right. right. <laughs> and he also believes that, you know, in addition to that, which is just interesting in and right. of itself, he claims to know that Obama and Hillary are right. literal demons from the underworld. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, and marry this to a space opera, because there, there's a whole side of him that believes in in aliens and in creatures and right. things that are not necessarily in the Bible anywhere or anything. <laughs> now, I just want to, you know, there are things we can get into that we could actually say Alex Jones is a bad person. Um, everything we're saying here is is just interesting belief system. It's like your opinion, man. Well, it is. I mean, if you think about some Catholicism, I mean, there's millions of Catholics yeah. in the United States. They believe in a just a kind of a shade off of that yeah. now catholics will be like fuck you don't associate me with alex sure Jones. no no but that's fair i mean if, if you will so to be clear if your belief system includes that there is a literal hell and a heaven and a literal demons right yeah. well why couldn't why wouldn't you be able to start looking around for maybe real demons and say well that person might actually be a real demon like right. why would that be so outside of the realm of your right so so there are I know there are people, uh, this happens to be older people that I know, who wouldn't have that much of a different point of view. Now, they probably wouldn't think Prince was killed because of the New World Order, but they would believe that Satan works in mysterious ways and, yeah. and might influence uh, politicians, and particularly politicians that they don't like. Man, I, I mean, I went to high school with several people that um, I was either friends or at least closely related to uh, in my friend circles uh, that did believe very literally in constant demon warfare all around us. Right. And, and, and I think that's part of the w reason why Alex Jones actually is popular is because, and we'll get into whether or not it's coincidence or he actually designs this, is he taps into 
unspoken fears and belief systems yeah. uh, f- that a lot of people have. You know, he's he's talking about the Bible, yeah. which the a majority of Americans are fully on board with. Yeah. So it's not you know it's it's not that weird. It's just that he combines these things in an odd way and delivers them in a in a very annoying way to li- to most Americans. I, right. I would imagine even most Republicans don't like Alex well, Jones. Well, no, I mean, like, when I got into him, I, it's like t- over 10 years ago, whenever it was, he was railing against Bush and against, like, it, it, like he even did this video where he snuck into the, uh, what's that, that orchard in California? The They do these, they do actual rituals there with, uh, like, they burn effigies and, and all these things. I'm forgetting the name, but it's a, it's a, it's become a prominent quote unquote famous thing in the internet that people now know about. And the truth of the matter is, yeah, there's rich people that go and do some funny ritual. Funny is not the right word. Some weird ritual in the woods. But then he takes everything about it literally, right? So he says, that is them invoking Satan. That is them doing this. That is the proof that everything I'm saying is real. But did he go to an actual event and film it? Yeah, he did. He actually did snuck. It. So when I started listening to him and watching some of his stuff, I was like, Oh yeah, I mean, look, there there are the oligarchs doing their little funny, funky rituals. Um, so there's some of the, some of his stuff that that's why I'm saying he can pull in people from a, a few different walks because one day he might be railing against something. You're like, yeah, right, that's right. wrong. Yeah, yeah. Other things that he believes along those lines is that he he believes all of these things are inside jobs. He believes 9/11 was an inside job. I, I'm guessing he believes George. Junior, yeah, uh, and and do that, the, and the and the globalists, absolutely. London bombings, inside job. The the two th- the twenty the two thousand four tsunami was a man made disaster. I didn't know that one. Yeah, what? <laughs> he believes Hurricane Katrina was a FEMA based thing. Okay, he believes tornadoes are caused by the U.S. government. All the school shootings are are uh, false flag operations. Right. Sandy Hook definitely included. Yeah, like for what though? What is he like? Yeah, they're trying to take our guns away. Remember. Yeah, they're trying to take oh. our guns away so, so that they can finally finish their their agenda. Yeah, so yeah. liberals or the globalists. No, no, the globalists. The globalists. Agenda they, forty-one, whatever it is. Uh, oh. They want to take away the guns, camps, so, all the stuff, so they can proceed to kill all of us. Right? That's well, and put us in camp. Actually, they probably want to enslave us. Is what they really want to do. Okay. And if we have no guns, what what are we gonna do? Right. Uh, Boston Marathon bombing, U.S. government. Uh, he's become no really famous for his gay bomb and gay frog conspiracies. Yeah, he he believes that the government is using chemicals to turn everyone gay and to right. make men into into women essentially, which is interesting because there's a lot of pundits who talk about this. Really, going back to the Roman times, there have been older men who claim that younger men are turning into women. It's just it's it, 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 it. The wonderful thing about becoming a amateur historian buff person is i it really wait wait, wait wait sorry you mean <laughs> you're reading history books while you're lifting weights about no about <laughs> about buff people oh i see um uh, what's that workaholics line where how did those buff dudes get off my radar um anyway the um uh when you when you actually start to study history a bit, you realize that nothing ever changes. Right. Old people, old men, and, and old women probably to some extent have been complaining about younger men and and children becoming less and less manly. Right. Because there's this, there's this cognitive uh, mistake that I'm guessing a lot of people is just sort of human nature to make that the old days are better than the new days. Yeah. And the old days, men were men. Because you remember all the good things that happened. You don't remember all the bad things that happened. Yeah. And the good old days, you know, it, no one ever says like, um, man, t- right now is such a great time. It's just, it's a very <laughs> rare thing, right? Well, and the, and the other trend that has been happening more so in the last, I don't know, 500 years at least, is things in modern society, or sorry, in, in I guess what I would say is in the Western world mostly, things do get increasingly simpler in some regards, right? Like you don't have to go to the outhouse to use the bathroom. Right. You get nice little toilet paper. You don't have to like yeah. hunt for your food all the time. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, and so that that's another <laughs> factor. But anyway, so he believes that 
so it's interesting that he's spouting a, a common thing that older men will say, which is that younger people are becoming more feminized. Right. But he doesn't say it's because of culture. He says it's because the U.S. government is actually... Purposely doing it. You with chemicals. Right. Uh, and, and then he also says that this is the big thing he's known for is he believes that frogs are turning gay. Uh, so I've heard of this. What what was the point of that one? Do we know? I don't know. Again, I, I'm just sort of reading. Well, that's some, just maybe a side effect. The well, side effect is that frogs are turning gay. Well, he believes that big pharma and the U.S. government are using chemicals to make frogs gay. I don't know if he thinks that it's by mistake or or by on purpose. I see. But the odd thing is is that he's it not not the gay part, but he's actually and and I think this might be why he actually brought this up was because there are pollutants leaking into the water system that are actually messing with of course <laughs> with with frog anatomy making more females than males listen this is my but that, point but that's not gay but, but this is my point with him unfortunately there's like this germ of truth and maybe 10 percent of his nonsense right yeah and that is and a lot of those are very serious problems yeah like globalism and globalist conspiracies do exist. They just don't exist in this cartoony way. They they exist in a more real, more damaging, real way. Well, and which is like on I a daily even, basis. I wouldn't even call them conspiracies. Uh, when you set up governments that support capitalism to the extent that the contemporary governments do, you're going to have uh, organizations, corporations, who are you know there these things are created uh, with full you know uh, they they say in their mission statement in their purpose sure. statement they will say we sure. are here to make money for yeah. our, for and, our for our investors and right. and and we are going to use whatever means are available to us to get there we sure. our mission is not to save the planet our mission is to make money and so it's and it and our government tr does a little bit of this what what i mean by conspiracy by the way is uh, take the bank. Is it HBC? What's the one that was basically? Uh, I don't remember. It was laundering billions of dollars for mob and for uh, for uh, Afghanistan, like for Taliban, all these things. And it's a bank. It's an international bank that's still in business. Yeah, that is a conspiracy, and that's right. a real conspiracy. We uh, yeah you right exactly. But but it's a very simple. But people. But it's not. But, oh, demons of hell unite! Right. right. It's it's it's. What we would say to be like uh, a... It's a know, criminal conspiracy. Right. It's a criminal conspiracy yes. to trick uh, yeah. people. And and guess what? Eventually, we figure it out. You right. Know, someone and someone so, but, blows the whistle. Blah, but blah, blah. because of things like this, it's the white noise, the, the floor noise level gets elevated to 100 decibels at all times. Well, again, and I think... You, and I want to be careful because you're saying the problem is there's you know there's a problem with Alex Jones because he actually gets an audience and that's your contention right it's it's problematic that Alex Jones has an audience that's your that's your thesis it's problematic that Alex Jones has an audience that then he can basically make everything and nothing sound plausible right, right. so he your thesis is Alex Jones, because of the way he presents his information, he's able to convince people of things that are probably not true, mm -hmm. and they're and they're ridiculous notions. And what I would say to that is, uh, I would I would agree that a lot of the things that he's saying are probably not true. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's probably not true that Obama and Hillary smell like sulfur and are literally devils. I'm just right. going to go on record. You're and going say, on a far out limb there. <laughs> I'm just going to say it's probably not true. Uh, but I, I'm, what I'm not quite sure of is if it's a problem or not, because there are lots of, again, if we just dip into you know, common religious practices, there are, we could make a similar argument uh, for evangelicals for mormons for jewish people for muslims we could and i would <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but my point and and, and that'd be fine yeah, that would be yeah. consistent but my point is is i, I don't want to i don't want to i want to be but there, be, because, so, okay. because i just want to say that for you and me uh uh and maybe even more so for me like alex jones is like the anti kirk do you know what i mean like you couldn't right. get more different from or more unappealing to me sure than Alex Jones. And so I just want to say, like, just because I don't like him doesn't give me the right to claim that 
his product as an entertainment service is somehow supposed to be eliminated from the planet and and anyone who likes it is stupid for liking it because you know people watch cops or you know uh the kardashians or you know and msnbc or you know people watch a lot of things and you know as long as each individual is an ethical moral human being i you know i you can entertain yourself however you want to yeah, where I land, I land in a funny place on this because we we take certain things as granted because someone a long time ago said they're inalienable. But then uh, I've never seen the data on any of this. For example, freedom of speech. It's like, well, of course, freedom of speech. Well, it's inalienable. We should all have freedom of speech. But we already know that freedom of speech does not actually, it's not an unbounded freedom at all times in all cases. Right. We know this. Yeah. Further, I've not seen the data. No one's ever presented the data that shows that actually it is perfectly fine to say whatever you want to an audience of humans and they will be unaffected negatively and that will have no negative consequences to society. Absolutely. Right? So I am not convinced that extreme, extreme inflammatory speech and constant, constant propaganda isn't a problem that should be stopped, right? I'm not convinced. Neither am I. That said... There is a huge difference. Look, I grew up going to church. Not, sorry, not in Colombia, but, but here. I would go to, to mass. And I got to say, like, even though I'm no longer a Catholic, my priest at the time seemed like a responsible purveyor of good thoughts and good ideas. Well, even, though, even though, of course, it was based on something that I now don't, don't agree with. That, that, that When I sat there... It was never inflammatory. It was never extreme. It was always like, like you know, we should try to be better people. Let's try to help one another. All these kinds of things. And, and so there is a big difference between that, even though it is based on religion, versus the, the extremes, right? The, the, yeah. the inflammatory people. Yeah. And there are things that we would not associate with freedom of speech that are extremely damaging to society that we would that we would talk about, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, just like the message, well, I guess it is sort of an issue of freedom of speech is is messages about bodies. Yeah. People right. in our society, you know, you, you, you plaster all these uh, photoshopped uh, particular body shapes of women, and that actually, when you add up all the factors, results yeah. in people actually killing themselves. Yeah. Or having massive mental illness problems. Yeah. And, and so there are things that we would not associate with Alex Jones that are absolutely horrible to society. And we should look at these things and we should dissect them and we should yeah. think about them. But my point is, is that just because you and I don't like him sure. <laughs> and don't agree with him doesn't ne equal automatic he should be eliminated and all sure. of his listeners are stupid. I, I will but, say- but We gotta oh, yeah. take a break, so let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't yet, go to patreon.com, become a patron of the podcast. When you do that, you get access to all of our premium episodes. This episode in its entirety is available to everyone, but we have a lot of patron exclusive episodes in which we do deep dives into various different psychologically related, psychological related topics. Also join the Facebook fan group. Uh, Umberto, you go there a lot. What's it like over there on the Facebook fan group? It is a cesspool. A mess, man. <laughs> no, it's actually kind of, uh, it's fun. And it, it is nice to see people um, interacting and forming a community. Uh, FPL really does a good job posting topics and, and sparking conversation. But a lot of people jump on and comment. And I think seeing that this, it, it, what's greatest is that I, I imagine a lot of times we're dropping little pebbles in a pond. And our pebble might be little and the pond might be murky, but it starts to spread these little waves and then other people spread more, more of those waves with their own pebbles. And that's good because it's more conversation around these topics and about mental health and everything. Also, you can go to our website and access our archive. Every single episode, so normally on phones, you only have access to like 300 episodes and we have almost 700 episodes. And so if you want to listen to all the episodes, you just go to our website, psychologyinseattle.com and every episode is there. Plus there's a list of every single topic. Mm -hmm. There's a long list. 
Also, an announcement, August 2018, we're going to have our 10-year anniversary show. What, what, what? And we haven't worked out the details or the date, but it, yeah. we, it started in August, so we yeah. thought we'd have that. And Lita might actually be there. Did you work? Th- yeah, we'll talk yeah, about yeah. it later. Um, also, if we meet our, our next Patreon goal, we will start a scholarship fund for one of the listeners. Okay, so let's go on here. Uh, he also uh, believes in fluoride being very terrible for you. And uh, guess what? He sells a a an uh, an antidote right to, that counteracts this fluoride. Oh, he sells a lot of merchandise that helps with a lot of the things that he talks about. If if not everything he talks yeah. about, yeah. Wait, by the way, here's another example. Um, is fluoride toxic? Yes. Is there is there some evidence that uh, you know there was a lot of lobbying happened many decades ago to use runoff waste chemical fluoride into water as a, as a way to dispose of it? Yeah. Is but like but then the dots don't all connect and they don't all add up and and the worst part about it is he tries to make it all related right everything is connected right and I think that's part of the uh, you know a similar a, a, a lot of similar arguments about Alex Jones you can make about Donald Trump in that either these two individuals are geniuses at knowing how to get an audience, Mm -hmm. how to motivate an audience, how to build an audience. So they're either geniuses, they're media geniuses, which I think you could honestly say, even if they're not geniuses outside of that. Because how many people are like Alex Jones? I mean, I personally, actually, I just got a call today from someone I think who likes to, who wants to be an Alex Jones or something. And he... um, you know, so up until this point, I've been basically like taking most interview requests. People yeah. say, I want to interview for my podcast or whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, half hour, it's not a huge deal in my life, especially if yeah. I can schedule it out like a couple months. And I think I need to change that policy. <laughs> really? <laughs> because today I was talking to this guy and the conversation was not interesting. And the questions were really long and I didn't even really understand what he was asking. And then at some point, things took a turn for the Jordan Peterson, and he started because he started out asking me. I thought it was like he liked me and he wanted to pick my brain about mm. about like podcasting or something. So it started off as just kind of like Kirk, tell me about this and that, and I was like, yeah. okay. And then and then at some point, Jordan Peterson came up, which was like, how this, how this, okay, fine. And then. He's and then he just started getting super hostile with me oh, about oh. I didn't really know exactly what, but it okay. felt really dangerous actually. Like it didn't okay. feel safe as he was. Yeah, I yeah, was yeah. like, wait, who are you? Yeah. What is this about? Yeah. And so anyway, uh, I think he's like a burgeoning Alex Jones. Sure. I, I'm not quite sure. I but see. And he's point, got a podcast or something. I th- okay. I don't even know. That's okay. how weird the conversation was. <laughs> okay, okay. And so the the thing is is that. Um, by the way, do you want to start taking some of these interviews? Uh, cause, sure. <laughs> cause you know, I, ha- you know, I answer the emails, the sure, bullets, sure. so maybe Absolutely. I should just forward them to you. Yeah. Uh, as long as I mean, if they're trying to talk to a, an expert, yeah. of course, send them to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, the questions he was asking were actually totally uh, answerable by you. Okay. Um, so if not better by you in some ways, so, um, I love, I love how the, the stupider, the crazier the questions. Oh, you're perfect. No, no. It was like general questions yeah. about podcasting. It yeah. had nothing to do with psychology, really. Anyway, um, so out of all the tens of thousands, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Alex Jones, Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump wannabes, there's very few who actually you know rise to the top. Yeah. I mean, think about all the YouTubers who right. would just, who are making very similar content right. and and have like, a hundred views and and you know it's not all about genius right like sometimes it, right place right time right voice right angle and then you get one story that picks up steam and then that one yeah. cascades to others and but you know prince we would call a musical yes. geni- a genius yeah. <laughs> but if he came around now with his music i don't think it would take off right you know it, it's it's same thing you have it's genius plus you know, t- uh, uh, magic of the time and the sure, place and everything. Exactly. Anyway, so so either uh, you know th- he's a genius, or he is haphazardly sort of backing his way into a into some sort of 
you know, popularity. And, mm. and, and so anyway, I don't know. Why did I start talking about well, that? Well, because we were talking about similarities with him and Trump and how they're able to like tap into these But why did I even start even on that? Spots. Why did I even start on that? Anyway, I don't know. Because you're an inflammatory host. <laughs> Let's get back to my notes here. Um, okay. So there's been a lot of talk. Uh, so I want to get into his psychology. Yeah. But first I want to just get one example because there's been a, he, he's, Alex Jones is, uh, a wonderful litmus test for internet <laughs> psychotherapists and clinicians to diagnose it. Sure. Uh, a blank canvas upon which uh, internet uh, <laughs> clinicians can, you know, vomit onto. And one such person is psychotherapist John Gartner, who says, I think Alex Jones has a diagnosis of malignant narcissism. Uh, first of all, taking off your shirt is exhibitionistic exhibitionistic. So that's the narcissistic component. But at the same time, he's doing an act of aggression. It's a power play, but it's a very narcissistic one. So psychotherapist John Gartner is diagnosing Alex Jones because Alex Jones took his shirt off you know, on the, there's this one really yeah. famous video uh, where he's on a new show or something, or he's with some of his sort of producer buddies or something. And he's like ripping his shirt off. Yeah, he gets sore and he just rips his shirt off. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's just so funny. Like, um, does he know what his body looks like? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, does. It, you know, uh, 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 anyway, uh, you know, not the body shame, you know. No, no, I mean, but his angle is in fact, like, we're at that point. We're at the point where shirts need to be ripped off. Okay. Is it, it really? Like, <laughs> it's that how, that's how bad it's going. That's what he's saying. He's, he's Basically, so, yeah. He's so upset. Okay. Yeah. But, um, I, mean, you, I don't know if you've seen, he does this often where he, he fake calms down for a second. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. I really should apologize. I, I don't know what... I am try, try not to let it get to me like this, but I just sometimes... You know, like this. And then he tries to calm down again. You know... Uh, it's uh, a preacher kind of thing, you know? Right. Like, so that's, that's another thing here is like there have been many great speakers who, yeah. who you like. I mean, Martin Luther King, for example, he would get really angry sometimes right. and he would have an escalation in his sermons and in his political speeches which is a tried and true, yeah. uh, you know, public speaker trope, you yeah. know, it's something that works. It's, it's, it's not, I wouldn't call it manipulative. I would just call it like, that's what you do to try to get a crowd going. You know, you, right. you, you start slow and you ramp up and then the, the crowd's with you. And, you know, yeah. uh, you could say a DJ does that when the beat drops. Totally. You could say like rock music, stu rock music, uh, you know, Depeche Mode does that yeah. when they like figure out what songs to do the encore with. It's just a common thing. And Alex Jones is just doing that. And, and I feel it used to be, I think, more common nowadays. In fact, he might stand out because you actually don't see a lot of, politicians in this country at least using that technique because it, it, it appears a little uncivilized or a little outdated right but you know i grew up in, in watching on tv some politicians sadly one of who was a great orator who was murdered but who absolutely had mastered that technique right so people who diagnose alex jones, now i don't know alex jones that well and maybe if i had more data i could actually comment but i'm guessing that it's very similar to donald trump in that it's like how can you diagnose someone who knows they're on camera who is providing a service to people and who is um uh, garnering more and more listenership because of his behavior how can you look at that and diagnose it i was with you on on that uh, the, the the part that I really don't I, I seem to, I depart your shores when it comes to a a president because they're no longer just on an entertainment show they they are the president and so it's like your behavior is no longer about trying to garner views and if it is it's about garnering it's about, that's the proof that I would offer <laughs> well, it's about garnering uh, money and yeah. about garnering votes I yeah mean, and a power it's not it's, no but but no. I, you know, name a president, particularly recently, who was, you know, uh, I don't get into that. But, you know, anyway, the point is, is that. Um, but when you play every inch for your personal image, like, no, that's so, so, not my hair. No, that's so, not the well, way I look. That's not I want to finish your your claim here. So you're saying that presidents, we can diagnose from afar. That's what you're saying? 
I'm saying that if you were going to use the, the uh, which I don't disagree with, that, you know, we can't look at a buffoon on a radio show and say, that's his persona. I agree with you. But it is a different thing to look at someone, well, first of all, across a variety of things, interviews when he wasn't, blah, 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 and now as a precedent, and say that now we have still no data other than he's a, a performer. I think that those are not the same. No, you're right. Yeah. A- a- and at the same time, politicians are basically always performing. I mean, do you think that Which Obama... Might be, might be part of the personality. Uh, sure. Yeah. But in hard to know is yeah. the thing. Obama, for example, do you think he acted a little different when he was with Michelle in the in, sure. in the in the bedroom, just the two of them? Yeah, yeah, but but you but you get the sense from him that the dial, the the dial had like the, three notches, the, not a thousand. The sense, but yeah. not the data is the well, point. Yeah, and even then though, you never saw him. He, he was never fighting every inch of his of his personal uh, of the way he reflected. Sure. Right. All those conclusions you can yeah. say, but that's far afield from the kind of data gathering that would be necessary sure. to diagnose someone with a personality disorder. Sure. One, two, personality disorders are not even understood, as I've talked about before, by the vast majority of clinicians, mental health clinicians, in my experience, yeah. do not understand personality disorders, not because they're stupid, but because they have almost no experience in treating them or in evaluating them. They might have bumped up against people with narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, but they didn't know they were bumping up against those people. So it takes, among even mental health people, very few understand what personality disorders are intimately, well enough to actually diagnose them, uh, you know, uh, with with competence. The other thing is, is even among those experts in personality disorders, they disagree about even what the personality disorders are sure. and would disagree about how they would be applied just to a regular patient. Yep. So, and on top of that, personality disorders are defined as a list of criteria that anyone can meet if you really kind of shove them into it. Like I, I'm actually, so I have the criteria from DSM-5 of narcissistic personality disorder in front of me, Berto, and I'm just going to say, let's just apply them to you. All right. Do you have a grandiose sense of self-importance? Yes. Do you sometimes exaggerate your achievements to kind of, you know, make your... Not my achievements, no. Well, yourself to make yourself look good. No. Okay. But you do think you have a grandiose sense of self-importance. Okay. Um, Are you... Do you think a lot about success and... Yes. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. Do you believe that you're a little special and unique? Yes. Okay. Do you do you like people to admire you? You know, like like yes. oh, I think you're yeah. Do you do you have a sense of entitlement? Uh, a bit, I'm going to say little, no to that oh, one. Okay. Um, do you exploit other people for your own no. ends? You know, on that one, I would say, obviously no in terms of the yeah. DSM five. But you could make it. I could make an argument that you do. I mean, I'm not going to right now. But I if I if I start, I know you well enough where I could I could get five data points. What that you, would back you might that. you might be able to, but I guess from my perspective, I have a pretty clear yes to the ones I said yes. The this one, I I, you I know, know I, I'm just saying like, but if I wanted to, sure, if you want, to, yeah. as if I was diagnosing from afar, yeah. I could do it, even this close to you. Uh, lacking empathy, eh, probably not. But could I make an argument that you lack empathy? Absolutely. Um, envious of others. Mm, uh, yes, I have suffered of envy. Not okay. so much now, but when I was in my 30s, I was quite envious. Do you show arrogance? Yeah, I've known <laughs> to be shown. I mean, more less and less as I grow older, but certainly when I was younger. Yeah. Okay, so I just listed nine criteria. Right, but, but my point is, you I would self-diagnose myself as a narcissistic personality, let alone Trump. <laughs> but you're not, but you're not. Is right, but I... I and and, and, and uh, you, so out of the nine criteria, yeah. you only need five. Yeah. And you and you said yes very quickly to five. So that's just a, a small, uh, and, and you do not have the right. disorder. I'm sure. here to tell you, as someone who sure, diagnoses sure. people with narcissistic personality disorder, sure. you aren't even freaking close okay because when you actually meet someone with narcissistic personality disorder Mm -hmm. like i have (laughs) you never forget it okay (laughs) it is a very distinctive personality that is not just arrogant (laughs) it's not just a little narcissistic it's not you know kind of stuck on yourself a little little, the person like when you enter a room you are the first person to be like, I am going to be heard. Not right. because you're a dick. I mean, you, you partially are narcissistic, but you also want to entertain people. That's true. You consider it your job, any room you enter, to entertain all of them. That yeah. is a super narcissistic thing to think. And yet, you are 
far from the threshold of actual I narcissistic see. personality disorder. So when people look at Alex Jones <laughs> and watch him rip off his shirt and say he's yeah, a yeah. malignant narcissist, right. it's like, what? Well, I think one of the things that happens, here's my analogy. You, uh, Mr. Trump and Alex Jones and myself, we're playing D&D. You that would, and man, that would be fun. Yeah, we're playing D and D. Now you are the DM. Oh, okay. Not only are you a DM, but you have a whole group of of specialist therapist consultants behind you that are helping you DM. Yeah. Well, you uh, guys agree. Well, I'll, I'll plug game to grow. Alex, Adam, and yeah, Adam. Yeah, they're they're there. They're yeah, helping. Yeah. Now you guys agreed on the rules of your of your world and everything. At one point in the game, Trump and Alex Jones think they've stabbed the monster to death. And you're telling them that they didn't, right? And, and, and you tell them all these reasons why they didn't. And they're like, well, but we think we did. Okay. In the meantime, both of them actually literally in physical world stabbed me. But, but we're arguing whether they broke the rules of the game. So the way we feel on the outside of the therapy world is we're going like, God, these people are such narcissists. And, but the semantics of are they technically personality narcissistic disorder as diagnosed by a professional that gets lost on the on the common folk <laughs> yes even yeah. among mental health clinicians yeah. i just have to say now i just want to say to all the listeners listening right now i what what gain do i get by basically incurring the hatred of none <laughs> of not only just regular humans but clinicians right. i don't know a single there isn't a single clinician who listens to me on this issue and says, Kirk, thank you. Right. No one thanks me. Right, right, right. No one likes me. Right. <laughs> my, my fellow clinicians are, whenever I talk about, you know, you can't diagnose Trump from afar, whenever I, I lay it all out, and I've done it like five or six times, and it's like I feel like every time I add some new data points, just, you know, so sure. that, I, that I find to be extremely convincing, and it's not me, it's the ethical boards of every sure. single, you know, so it's not like I'm alone in, you know, in, in terms of the uh, ethics experts. But in my field, when I talk about this, they're like, Kirk, you don't, I mean, how can you even say that? And so, so, so if, if it, and this isn't even a political podcast, I'm saying, the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm trying to preserve our profession. Yeah. I don't think people understand, <laughs> like, if we allow ourselves to go that uh, off the rails, we we will lose we people already disrespect us yeah and if we can't follow our own ethical gut now if we change the ethical guidelines and we decide yes we can diagnose from afar then let's go for it because that's what our that's what our profession has said our profession has met has discussed has researched has looked behind you know has has interviewed for decades and the decision has right. always been consistent you cannot diagnose a politician yeah. from afar you have to they have to hire you as a as a as someone who is assessing them. You have to sit down with them, and then at the end of that, you have to get their consent to talk about yeah. it. So, by it, the way, unless the, it's the, a criminal investigation, the, the, the whole thing, by the way, is um, there is a big flaw in this. I think one of the hopes that some people might have is they're they're looking for some expert to rise up from the darkness and say, "I have scientific proof right. that the person you dislike is." actually scientifically flawed right which is a gross misunderstanding of mental illness right because it there is no diagnosis of there's something wrong with you or yes. you're a you're like it's actually yeah you know a dis, you're a despicable human right. being or your right. views are wrong you know like it there is no diagnosis like that there's no diagnosis of moral uh you know right. greatness or or lowitude you know right. what i mean it there that but that's because people think mental illness means there's something like fundamentally well, wrong with you and it's not like there is a provision i could be wrong where the was it the 25th amendment or whatever where pers narcissistic personality disorder is a reason for impeachment <laughs> right right there isn't right so it's like we gain nothing from such a diagnosis but right. but the flip side is that i th i think what happens is that there are behaviors that seem so out of the norm for people and they've heard of this thing called narcissism, right? And they're like, well, that's clearly narcissism. Or schizophrenia, which is another thing he's being accused Oh, of. I didn't know that one. But basically what I think no one understands is the distinction between a word and an actual professional guideline for how to diagnose something. Right. One is a word and, and that what, we all use. And what people will misinterpret me as doing is defending Donald Trump or Alex Jones. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> 
Be- Which I know you love them, but that's not the point. Believe me, people. <laughs> believe me. I am not defending these two guys. Like, Put your shirt back on. <laughs> no. Yeah. Can you imagine? I'm, I'm not, not defending, defending him. Um, you know, that is not my point. My uh, point is def- I'm defending our profession. It, yes. When there is a Democratic president after Trump, which I'm fairly sure will happen, I, I will get news articles about people diagnosing that guy yeah. or woman, and I will talk about it then too. And I will say the exact same thing. Yeah. It will be, there will be no difference. I, it will be, it's, this is, this goes for anyone, you know? And, and that's my point is like, people were diagnosing Obama. But anyway, the point is, is like, you can't, you can't diagnose Alex Jones by watching him perform. Uh, you'd, you would have to sit down with him in person, which someone has done, which I will get into in okay. a second. So let's get into the history here. Uh, born uh, 1974, which means he's about your age, which is weird because he seems a lot older. What? Than, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. What? Yeah. Weren't you born in 73, 74? 75. Yeah. There's no way he is my age. Yeah. He looks like he's 55. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we're almost 55, so I mean... Well, I'm 59, but the point <laughs> is... Yeah. Uh, he got his start in 1995 on Access TV in Austin, Texas. Did you know that? I did not know that. Access TV. So basically, if you're not from the States, it's you, you any, it's like public access where if you just sign up, like, like, I think I was on public access in high school with my band. I think, you know, you can mm. just like sign up as long as you follow the procedure. It's just public access TV. And he became famous because he was a Y2K fear monger. Yeah. <laughs> and he ranted that there was, the world is going to end. And he was selling his survivalist. He had a survivalist shop. So when you understand right. the beginning of Alex Jones, I think you understand Alex Jones. Well, you know how I, ori- now I remember how I originally came to him was there was a thing called Coast to Coast, Art, Art, some Artie's Coast to Coast or something like that. It was, uh, it's still on, I think. And it's uh, a lot about aliens and conspiracies and other things or whatever. Um, but it was through that line that I, I remember I arrived at the Alex Jones Shores. Interesting. So he he was now a lot of people are into Y two K. All you know, Seattle what back then too was filled with tech people, and all the people who uh, were my friends in tech, they were all telling me like Y two K is no joke. That yeah, we don't know what's going to happen, but I've heard some very intelligent tech people say yeah. like. This could be a major problem. It could shut down our electrical grid. Yeah. Our, you know, everything could kind of come to a screeching halt. And like in a few days, our country could be in utter chaos. I mean, a, a lot of money and work went on to make sure that didn't happen. <laughs> right. And and so now after Y two K, nothing happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you you were in tech uh, as a hot dog tech person back then. So did, yeah. did you have a thought about hot Y2K dog, back then? Hot dog machines. Yeah, no, no. I mean, what happened was um, it really wasn't as sudden as people saw because I, I think most people became aware of it maybe two years to go or something like that. Um, so, so they updated all their machines. <laughs> well, no, what I'm, what I'm saying is in the tech industry, this started becoming a known thing that they were going to have to address way sooner than the mainstream press reported on it, right, right? Right, right? So they had many, many years to start actually trying to fix the software. Okay. But it doesn't mean, like, that, that, both, both were things you are, worried? Were you worried before Y2K? No, because I knew that they had patched most of the problems. Oh, okay. <laughs> and also... Um, I actually <laughs> left town. Uh, I went to uh, Port Townsend that, that, that night. Yeah. Because I, there was a part of me that there were two things I was worried about. Yeah, I was worried about you know the off chance that Y two K and riots start in Seattle, so I'd yeah. like to be outside the city. And the other thought I actually was worried about was that there was going to be a a bomb that was going to blow up the Space Needle, because and this is prior to nine eleven. Mm. I left Seattle because I thought the terrorists were going to blow up the oh, Space Needle because. A few years earlier, at the border coming into the United States from Washington, on the Washington right. border from Canada, they caught someone that had a huge bomb. Oh, okay, and they they didn't. I think they were headed to L.A. or something. Oh, anyway, geez. so so anyway, uh, but so Y two K, nothing happened. And I was in Vancouver, or I was in Whistler at the time. Oh, okay, <laughs> uh, so so Y two K, nothing happened. And so then, what does he do? Well, so so I just want to back up and say again, he he owned a survivalist shop mm-hmm. in, I'm guessing, in Austin. 
He had, I'm guessing, a brick and mortar survivalist shop. Yeah. In Austin, Texas. Okay, just think about that. And he has, he's on a, a, a show on Access TV right. in Austin. Okay, if you were to talk about Alex Jones at the time, you wouldn't call him a TV personality. No, not at all. You would call him the owner of a survivalist shop who is on Access TV trying to advertise for his survivalist shop. Yeah. And the one thing he figured out during that time, and again, I'm not a super Alex Jones historian, but I'm guessing he figured out, huh, if I not only advertise for my survivalist shop, but I actually like scare people into believing that they need my survivalist shop stuff, then I make more money. Right. And Access TV is, you know, there's no advertisements on Access TV. It's just public access. So he's making no money off of being on Access TV. He's only making money in the survivalist shop. So right. he, he learned a very important lesson at that time, which he learned over and over again after, which is find something that people are worried about, talk about it, get information, get a good mm, kind. And early, right. I, I, I saw clips of him during this time, and he already had his kind of shtick down. It's it's toned down, you know, significantly. Meaning back then or now? Back then. Oh, okay, yeah. But he had he had uh, he had a, a very similar kind of shtick in terms of how he communicated, you know. And so get people afraid about Y two K, and maybe he was legitimately actually kind of worried. But doesn't hurt that he's making a shit ton of money. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And he's selling his water filtration systems because right. you know Y two K is happening. You're going to run out of water. And but then Y two K came and went, and that was that. So then he need, so he was sort of out of his uh, out of his fear mongering. Well, then nine eleven happened, and that gave him another chance to to sell his wares. You know what I mean? He could start selling. Oh, of course. He could start selling gold or you know whatever it was yeah. that he was selling in terms of people were you know you and i were terrified after by the way the, the gold thing is is has been very common amongst the, the 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 extreme right wing radio shows like all of them used to peddle gold when i was listening to them right it, i'm guessing it's not because they are super into that product it's because they know their their shtick actually promotes that sort of that Cause, sort of because it's the fear that everything's coming yeah, to an end right. a lot of it is the remember remember the 50s and it's like well it's coming to an end folks and the only thing you can do now is stock up on gold and buy some guns and stay at home well and and i don't know if this is exactly what they're saying but it's just to point out how ridiculous that is if it's really the end gold isn't going to help you my friend <laughs> what, what's going to help you is like food and water right. and and i maybe like tennis shoes and clean socks right uh cigarettes uh drugs antibiotics um, i you know <laughs> gold is like the last i mean at least paper you could wipe your ass with it you know what i mean but the, can't you like when you start losing teeth can't you put in gold fillings and <laughs> yeah, stuff? yeah yeah uh so that so 9 11 happened and then obama happened and that gave him more material to sell his wares you know end of the world's happening yeah and and again if he says obama is a demon then that's even going to make people more worried because it's right. like, oh my God, Antichrist, uh, end of the world, you know, Revelation, because yeah. uh, Revelation talks about there. Some people go straight up to heaven, but there's also like before and after that wars and like yeah. strife and famine and everything, and then some people are sort of left behind a little bit, waiting to go up. You right. know what I mean? So it's like you need to survive. Anyway, then Hillary happened, and she's a reptile person. Then Trump, and so, so it. You just follow the history, and again, you follow the 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 beginning of right. Alex Jones, and you're just like, oh, I totally get it. Like yeah. once I learned that that that's where he started, Y2K, yeah. when Y2K was very was legitimately scary, yeah. And he was a he was an owner of a survivalist shop. <laughs> I mean, so I'm just imagining Alex Jones is like, man, I like outdoorsy stuff, and I like survivalist stuff, and you know what? Maybe the world is coming to an end. Right. Day. You know, and he's just like, you know, and he's 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 really good at like. By selling. the way, he's in his twenties. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. You're right. He's he's like a young man. Yeah. And he's selling. He's like getting his business off the ground, and then he's like, huh? I wonder if I went if I got on Access TV if I could like get more business. You know, it just seems like it all makes sense. Yeah. But uh, let's take a break and then we'll finish this up. What do you say, Bruno? Yep. All right, we're back from the break. So I just want to point out that there's a couple other radio personalities that I can point to who I think are similar. Um, I was a big Dr. Laura Schlesinger fan. Do you remember her? Oh, yeah. So she was in the 90s as well. Right. 
And when she first was on the radio, I was totally compelled by her. And actually, I have to say that me becoming a therapist has something to do with me listening to her radio oh, wow. show. <laughs> now, when she was on in 94, 93 was when I was listening to her, 90, mm-hmm. 93-ish, she was a normal person. Oh, really? Okay. Who probably had a couple like avant-garde points of view. Like I remember she would talk about how... Uh, Point, like cause a lot of women would call into her. It was a call-in show. Sure. And women would call in and be like, my husband is into porn. What do I do? And she's like, porn's not a big deal. Don't worry about right. it. Like that was kind of her thing. And she was just trying to be sex positive, you know, before that was a thing, or at least before I knew it was a thing. And back then she, you know, and she, she was sort of sexist against women at times, but it, it was pretty, pretty normal stuff in my opinion. Right. Then in the later '90s and in the in the early aughts, she she started to have some very strange points of view that became very controversial. Right? Do you remember any? Oh of that? yeah. So she was one of the people I would listen to in the same time frame. This was, um, yeah, it was it was probably after 9/11, I think. So early aughts. Yeah. So we're talking ten years after I was listening to her. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Right. Do you remember what she was spouting about that everyone hated her for? I mean, she. It, uh, no, but I, I remember she was in the same camp. Uh, like I would listen to them and I would often hear, oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Because I started when Clinton was still in power. Okay. So it was, because a lot of the, a lot of the stuff was anti-Clinton. Okay. Well, anyway, the point is, is that my thing about Dr. Laura Sessinger was that I saw her progress from a, just a regular radio call-in yeah. uh, therapist and she's not even a therapist. She's like, I think she's like a physician of some sort. But anyway, um, and just a, you know, a just a tame call-in radio show where people yeah. get advice. And she's just talking off the top of her head and blah, 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 to what she morphed into, which was this controversial mm-hmm. figure that I could no longer listen to. Another person, same time, Tom Likas. Do you remember Tom Likas? Of course, yeah. Although he, he was... Um he was always sensationalist. No, you know? no, 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 really? no, 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 no. I was listening to him in the early days as well. Oh. And it must have been the radio station I was listening to in the early 90s. But Tom Likas was a vulnerable, regular guy. He talked oh. about, he, he would talk about his wife. He'd okay. be like, he'd be like, yeah, you know, and he would talk about like trouble parking in his neighborhood. Oh. He was just like, he was sort of like a, like an Adam Carolla. So this is early 90s. Yeah. He was just like, you know oh, what? Oh, wow. And he wasn't like, uh, you know, right wing wacko. No, I mean, it, he was just a, he was just sort of a, he would okay. just sort of talk off the top of his head. So I didn't realize, yeah, because I, when I started listening to all of this was late 90s. Right. So then by the, but then fast forward five years later, 10 years later, and yeah. he's the, he's the biggest douchebag who has ever lived. Right. And he's, you know, I, I remember like tuning into him once on the radio and he's, it was like, show us your tits Friday or yeah. something flash and, you would flash your lights and and then and then like women would flash boobs yeah. or something and then there was it was just like the grossest most douchebaggery I'd ever heard and I was like wait this is the same Tom Likas who would talk about his relationship with his wife and but see at first because you know I was younger and stupid too but and it was also the times I liked him at first because yeah, he wasn't in fact like he said a right-wing wacko, no! Or a convicted felon, no, right? Yeah. Instead, he was talking about, like, normal stuff and sex and, oh, did he really do that to her? Wow, you know? But I didn't realize it was douchey. I just thought it was fun sex stuff. <laughs> and then, at the time, flashing, you know, flashing your lights to have girls flash their boobs seemed perfectly fine. I mean, you know, consensual, consensual boob flashing, whatever. Yeah. But it, but anyone who knows Tom Likas will just associate him with like complete like uh, that whatever that is, right? And, and, well, and I, I and I also didn't know. I didn't foresee that what was going to happen was the whole alt right and whole like extreme men's rights movement and stuff. Oh, that's what he went into. If he didn't, everyone, a lot of people that listened to him, including some of my friends, definitely went into. I understand. It. So yeah, so so a similar progression. Yeah, uh, you can even say Donald Trump had a similar progression. Sure. There was a time when Donald Trump and I'm, you know, we're sure. old enough to remember. He's been in the media since we were kids. Yeah, and there was a time when he was in the media when he was just kind of like a, like just a regular person who liked to talk about things. Yeah, but who would still defraud everyone he worked with and. Sure, and, his and, business and, practices were yeah. were uh, of news media, but there were a lot of, you know, capitalists who 
were talked about in this way. Donald Trump just was the guy who was also on talk radio shows. I know he would go on David Letterman. He certainly and, did not appear on Oprah and things like that. And he wasn't inflammatory. About right. It. He was just kind of, you know, maybe he had some thoughts. Who knows? He's always been probably a little off, you know, like going back, I think, to the 80s and 70s or something. Journalists knew that his his publicist wasn't a publicist. It was him. You know what I mean? That, yeah. that whole thing. So he's out, he hasn't always been like a completely a, a regular dude, but... But his, but the things he would say publicly, uh, like for instance, I think during the Clinton years, he was like pro Clinton and like yeah. pro Democrat and pro gay marriage yeah. and pro, pro you know all these kinds of things. And I mean, I, I I've said this before, I think I've said this before. I was a fan of The Apprentice when it first came out, right? And I looked up to him. I don't know why. I don't. Well, like I was like, it, you're oh, not. He seems like a successful business person. Well, and you're not, what you're not a stupid person. Uh, uh, so so the re, so but. <laughs> The reason why you liked him is because up until that point, the things he had presented were likable. And so, but then the internet happens and then Obama happens and then people start turning, to, you know, for for someone to rise up and speak up against Obama because half America or not more hated him for various different reasons, you know, whatever reasons you might say, whether it's legitimate political reasons or race. Certainly not more than half because he got voted in twice. <laughs> well, whatever. But, you know, a third, so it's a 25%, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's at least 30%. Sizable yeah. percentage. Yeah. And and so you you have this need for someone to rise up, or at least if you do kind of rise up, you get a response. Right. You know, uh, um, Trump says uh, in, a, you know, in 20, uh, in 2009, after Obama's elected, Trump says something on some show that is like pro Obama. How much response does he get? He says one thing that's a little anti Obama, boom, huge response. Yeah. You know, and, and then lots of criticism. But then that that raises his his profile. Yeah. He's like, huh. You know, and I'm just so so it's the same with Tom Lika, same with Dr. Laura Sessinger, in my opinion, is that if your goal is to be famous and your goal is to stay relevant, which which means in the media, then you, the it, it, there's a certain pathway available to you that if you don't have the scruples to avoid, you might be able to be lucky enough to capitalize on and actually rise so high that you could become president of the United States. Yeah, I, I do. I do see that. I also I think there's also an aspect with Trump though. Where I feel like as he got a bit older, his mind didn't keep up with his sure. stuff. Because he clearly has shot in himself in the foot in so many ways that he didn't used to, right? Like, he didn't use, on The Apprentice and all that stuff, he would but, say mean stuff to the contestants. But would he be president if he didn't do those things, is the point. I don't know. But uh, the yeah, point, I and the I don't want to talk about Donald Trump so much. So my so my much point is, that. is that I have, off the top of my head, and I'm not a media expert, I, I can think of three people who are quite similar at by the end of the game and yeah. very, very um, different when they started out. You know, just kind of normal people who who we, anyone could relate to, uh, to to a point where they were such cartoonish versions of of a human being. And I think Alex Jones is one of those people. I think he started off, you know, probably talking about staying within the bounds of Y2K yeah. kind of worries and selling his wares. And over time, he gets sure. re rewarded for like, you know, expanding the conspiracy a little bit more, you know, because once you move on to 9-11, then what do you do? Well, you can talk about it's an inside job. Okay, once that kind of dies down and that energy dies down, what what's left? Well, you have Obama. You could, what do you say about Obama? Other than like he's from Africa or so, like that yeah. doesn't really get people going. You say he's a he's a devil, which you know again a sizable amount of yeah. Americans actually believed before Alex Jones even said that. Yeah, right, right. Um, then or, you know, or they believed he was the Antichrist. Right, and yeah. so you you a sizable <laughs> percentage of Americans literally thought he was the Antichrist, and so you know, and then you you throw that out there and you get a response and you're like, oh, I've, I'm tapping into something here and yeah. people are listening now and okay, I'm pissing off a whole bunch of people but that doesn't bother me because that just ra raises my profile in the general media and gets podcasters like you and me to talk about him, you know, and so it's just like, it's a win-win. You saw though, he does have limits. Even he has limits. The, did, you, did you see what the Pizzagate stuff, what happened? Right. 
He exactly. had to back off. Right. Because that that's that's a good example, and there's other examples, of evidence that he's not mentally ill. Yeah. You know, he is playing a game. He's being media savvy. He and those so in Pizzagate, what happened was he was talking about a pizza organization that was a pizza place, like a pizza store. A pizza store that in was DC. That was uh, working with the New that World John Order. John Podesta and all these guys. So the, and Hillary, they basically, it is a, du- they have a dungeon in this pizza place where they rape, torture, kill uh, ritualistically right. babies and, and kids. And a listener like drove by and shot up the place with a gun. No one got hurt, but yeah. but like he, he later said. He, he went in, he like, yeah. And he, and he said, yeah, I did this because Alex Jones said that something's going on here. And then Alex Jones went public and said, oh, by the way, uh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. And and, and no, I don't. It seems I, like it's not a thing. So, okay. So if he really believed it, right, then he would have been like, well, that's, that's right. <laughs> good job. Yeah. Good job, listener who shot up the place. And the fact you didn't find something is because they're so good at covering it up. Right. If he actually believed it, <laughs> and he actually believes right. he is the voice of reason, shouting. Yeah into the you know into the internet like listen to me i know the truth right then that would be a perfect opportunity not to back down that's right and he absolutely backed down because he is playing a character so this is like for example a big difference between someone like him and someone like like a steve bannon because steve bannon uh, you, you can say a, a lot of things about him but um he is a consistent ideologue when you hear him speak in public and what comes out, you know, seemingly from private conversation and stuff, he is consistent in his ideology. So you can, and if you if it scares you, fine. If it does, if you like it, whatever. But you should believe what he says because he means it. Right. Alex Jones, as you point out, who knows what he believes? Well, I I think I know uh, what he believes. I, I I who knows? But but we'll get into that in a second. But just to wrap this up real quick. There's a famous story about him last year. You know, he's going through a divorce, and and a uh, he has three children with his with his now ex wife, and yeah. they were going through a custody battle. And the wife, his ex wife, was claiming that he was mentally unstable. And so, to people in on the internet world, they're like, "Oh, well, his wife. That, right. That's proof that he's mentally ill, because yeah. his ex wife is saying, look, he he's mentally unstable." I'm here to tell you, as someone who has worked closely with divorcing people, both legally and otherwise, that is a very common accusation that people will make against their ex-spouse as evidence that they should have sole custody of their kids right. or they should get some sort of special compensation when it comes to the divorce. It, if you actually believed every single thing that was said about ex-spouses in family court in divorce... Uh, the the ninety nine percent of the country are pedophiles and mentally unstable. It's just like it's it, that means nothing to yeah. me. Now she might actually be seeing something, and if we had her on the show, maybe I'd I'd listen to her data. But just that in the news of like wife is accusing, yeah. you know, and she would know. And it's like, well, uh, context is everything. Um, but he went on to testify on his own behalf. Well, let me let me get to that. Oh, okay. So 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 his wife is saying, look. I should get the kids because Alex Jones is mentally unstable. Yeah. Look at his look at what he says on on TV and on the radio. Right. And then his lawyer said stated on the record, not just haphazardly, on yeah. the record he stated that Alex Jones is quote unquote playing a character. He is a performing artist. And he argued that Alex Jones uh, you know, to judge Alex Jones, uh, his personality based on his radio show is like judging Jack Nicholson based on his role in the Joker uh, in, yeah. in the Batman movie. Uh, they they said it's satire, it's it's sarcasm, and to those of you who think that the lawyer was talking off the cuff, I guarantee you, there's no way the lawyer was talking off the cuff. No, no, he was not talking. But- no, no lawyer is going to uh, go on the record and say something like that without having talked with their client yeah. first. Well, but to play a devil's advocate, so as as we just saw, apparently Trump's lawyer, out of the goodness of his heart, paid off. Uh, a porn right. star to right. silence her. Right. So, does just because a lawyer says something in court also does not mean it's true. <laughs> true, right. but it definitely means that Alex Jones said yes. Go ahead and use that. Oh yeah. Well, maybe right. No, I would. I. <laughs> I, I. I mean, yeah, maybe. Of course. Like, do but, I believe it? Of course. Like, look, yeah. I. I certainly believe that Alex Jones is nowhere near as crazy as he comes off. 
at the same time, if the, again, well, well, let's let's if, wrap let's if, wrap if, up yeah. let's wrap up the court case. So Alex Jones came forward after right after that. Okay, but I just want to break down this moment. Yeah. So when I broke down the Austin, Texas moment, let's break down this moment. So you're you're Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, you're you're like any other parent, and you want access to your kids because right. because you, you love your kids, and so he's fighting. If he's truly that unhinged, he wouldn't care. But anyway, he's like, I want, I want, you know, I love my kids. I want access. Well, he might care about his kids and still be unhinged, right? Sure. But my point is, is it's like, if we're looking for ticks in the column of like a normal personality, it's like, you know, he's acting extremely normal in this instance. But he's sitting here and he's like, okay, yes, use this, you know, look, she can't use my TV show as evidence I'm mentally unhinged. You know, that's that, you know, lawyer, we got to, we got to, put the kibosh on that because if the judge is going to and the jury are going to look to uh, my tv performances like i'm done <laughs> so we got to figure out a way and the lawyer's like well let's 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 say it you know you're you're playing a character we'll just say how about that and alex jones is like okay if that's going to work great so lawyer does that but then what alex jones didn't realize is that the internet's actually paying very close attention right. to what's happening and actually get their hands on it and it blew up. Right. I think Alex Jones just thought no one really cares about the like inner workings. Divorce proceedings. Yeah, like no one's going to pay attention right. to the to the, or, or or this will because how many other things have happened where He forgot what platform made him big. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how many things have happened where he dodged a bullet about sure. that where something did slip out but yeah. it, it didn't catch, you know, the internet's sure. attention. And so he's like, you know, let's just let that go. And, and but it, then he does it and then the internet blew up. Right. It was like it, it got to my ears. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like, yeah. I don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. And I, and I was like, Alex Jones, lawyer, says that he's a putting on a persona. And I was like, yep, yeah, makes sense. Very- and, and by the way, the Young Turks did a segment where, because Jenk has known him for years and they don't get along anymore, but he's come out saying, saying multiple times, like, look, this guy is putting on an act. It's an act. He's trying to make money and sell his products. That's what he does. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I suddenly like the Young Turks all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you're Alex Jones. What do you do? Okay, here are the factors. His kids are actually old. <laughs> these aren't five-year-old kids. You know, these these kids. One of his kids, uh, Rex Jones, actually works on for Infowars. Okay, you know what I mean. So we're not talking like access Little babies. Yeah, I mean, so maybe uh, maybe some of them are still minors, but mm-hmm. you know, they're 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 getting older in age when they have the, uh, oftentimes choices to who who they want to visit with anyway. Right. You know what I mean. And so, so so you're saying okay. I can either completely trash my career right now and win this custody battle, or I can completely come out against my lawyer, mm-hmm. save my, and, and try to salvage my my brand, um, lose this court battle, but win the overall war because I'm going to get access to my kids anyway because they're older. Well, plus would him, if he just argued that his show is a satire and he goes on his satire show and says no, that. No, he, he actually went on record in the court and refuted. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Refuted yeah. his own lawyer statement. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 my, right. my, my show is real, right. you know. Right. And, and, and he's like, my, my lawyer my lawyer is lying. It was after the, after the outrage though, right? Right, of yeah. course. Yeah. It wasn't before. Right. It wasn't direct. It wasn't like, stop talking. I didn't authorize you to say that. <laughs> exactly. Alex Jones was presumably <laughs> like, around yeah, when yeah. that was happening. It was, right. it was later. Right. Okay. So now uh, you wanted to talk about what you actually think is personality. Actually. Well, all I was going to say was really that uh, I, I actually do think you could play devil's advocate and say that uh, if he is someone that believes even 60% of what he says, then he might actually believe that the ends justify the means at this point. Meaning, of course, I'm going to lie in court. Of course, I'm going to ask my lawyer to say whatever. I don't want to lose my kids because my kids, I want to save their lives because the shit is coming. So that is one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that he, you know, I know a lot of people that seem perfectly fine and yet believe a lot of weird stuff. Right. Right? Yeah, so, I know you know people right. like that. I know so, people very close to right. you who you so know. it's very to, possible And that, those people have perfectly functional yes, lives. Yes, exactly. So it's very possible he actually believes like 80% of the shit. Sure. But not, but not actually in that internal constant rage way. Right. More like, yeah, they probably are doing that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> the, the way that... I, I, you know, I'll never forget. I I was at a bumper shoot. Well, maybe I shouldn't talk about specifics, but I, I was somewhere where I was hanging out with some friends, yeah. and a friend of a friend showed up, 
and we were just talking about something. And I was talking to this guy, and he's a musician, and yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm we're we're talking about music, and I'm and I was, and he seemed really cool. He just seemed yeah. like uh, he was on his way up in the music world and whatnot. And then all of a sudden, he just says, "You know what? I saw this thing about the flat Earth thing, you know." And I at first I didn't <laughs> at first I didn't really uh, think it was real, but then. You know, I, I, there's this one YouTube video, and man, like, right. <laughs> like I just, you know, it, it's interesting, you know? And I looked at him, and I was like, completely lost respect for the guy. I'm like, <laughs> what? You know, and that juxtaposition in my head of just like, smart, musician, right. hip, younger, on his way up, in Seattle, normal right. guy, and a flat earther, like he's <laughs> allowing for that to be real. Right. I was like, oh, I get it. You know, most people are very susceptible to these things because they just don't understand science. Right. Or they don't have sources to help them along the way, you know? So to believe that he might believe in some of these things is, you know, not well, not that weird, right? How many people... Not that abnormal right. is the thing. How many people in their lives have done an actual experiment, even in a class, even in a classroom setting? Like a, a, a scientific experiment where they had to like Walk start from through. a hypothesis, actually try several trials, document their findings. Well, not even that. Like, how many people have read a scientific journal article? Sure. You know, actually, yeah. actually, just read one word. So it's really hard of an actual study. A lot of these videos, man, they use a lot of words. They yeah. they present diagrams, and, yeah. and you're like, but look at this, and you're yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I have I I had close friends and family members who, after 9-11, were a hundred percent convinced it was George W. Bush who did it. You know what I mean? Like they were a hundred. You know, they were yeah. totally, and they and they had videos to back up their right, right, anyway. Right. So now I just want to say in in conclusion here. He, there are, uh, he, like we're saying, number one, there's a lot, there's a good chance that he actually is one of those people who actually believes in conspiracy theories. There's a lot of people out there like that. He, the, the, if you just bullet pointed his points of view, it's, it's, it's not different from what a lot of people believe. Number two, he might actually be schizophrenic or narcissistic personality disordered. He might actually be. Yeah. I'm not saying he doesn't have it. I'm just saying I don't know he has it and anyone who has diagnosed him from the information that they get from watching him or listening to him is unethical and doesn't know what they're talking about right. i'm extremely skeptical of that um and, and i'll just tell you that in my heart i want to believe that alex jones is mentally ill i just want to say that my emotions right want i want to believe that guy's crazy because i don't like him <laughs> i don't like what he's saying sure. i don't like the kind of it's things he kind of provokes in people. It's just, it's displeasing to me. Yeah. My heart wants to diagnose him. My heart wants to diagnose Donald Trump. Yeah. But my head understands that the bigger picture here. Your which body's is, saying yes, but your mind is saying no. <laughs> number three, um, and here's the point I was getting to earlier, which some people I'm guessing are screaming at their phones waiting for me to talk about, is he actually has been formally diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so it, during this divorce proceeding, there was a family, I think a family therapist, I couldn't really, they called her a social worker, but I think they meant family therapist. And the, the family went to Dr. Alyssa Sherry. And a, Dr. Alyssa Sherry in court went on record saying that she testified during court that a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder was in uh, Alex Jones' file that she received, I think, from a previous clinician. I see. And so she said, yeah, someone else diagnosed him with that. Yeah. She wasn't diagnosing him with that, you understand. Some other clinician, uh, under some other circumstances, yeah. which I'm trying to figure out how, actually diagnosed Alex Jones with narcissistic personality disorder. So I don't know the details on that. Okay. But we do have evidence that someone assessed him and actually diagnosed him with it. So, but having said all that, does that mean that he quote unquote has narcissistic personality disorder? It's unclear because one, uh, I don't really know the source on this. And two, I hope people understand after I read the uh, actual criteria, DSM-5, that narcissistic personality disorder is not an actual thing. Yeah. It is a label that mental health, just a, because most, many people wanted the personality disorders to be completely eliminated from the DSM-5. Sure. There was a, it would almost happened. 
In fact, I remember hearing, you know, a few years before it was published, they've eliminated the personality disorders. And I remember being like, huh, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Uh, so if it weren't for that kind of random thing, narcissistic personality disorder wouldn't even be a thing. Right. Do you we know what I mean? It, talking it, about it. It'd be like, what are you talking about? That's, that's like the old days when they used to diagnose gay people as having a mental illness. Right. It's not a real thing. Just because it's in the fucking DSM-5 does not mean it's a real thing. <laughs> now, the DSM-5 does not claim to be of real things. It is a tool for yep. uh, mental health clinicians to communicate to one another and to research and to provide, uh, you know, educated guesses on treatment. You know, if someone fits the criteria here, then this is the treatment that might be helpful for that. Right. That's it. It is not... There's, there's no, you can't it empirically prove that one person has narcissistic personality disorder, especially when you add up 10 clinicians yeah. and they all give different diagnoses. And, 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 and again, at what point when 10 clinicians all agree, okay, it is settled. He, this person has uh, narcissistic personality disorder. And then we applaud. We all get up. We applaud. We, we throw a big celebration. We pop open the champagne. What happens after that? What do you mean? What's the next step? We've proven. We we won. Right, right. So what? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, the the last point here is uh, the psychological angle I want to talk about is the illusory truth effect. Have you heard of this? No. It, it's been studied for decades. It's it's something you know about but just don't know okay. the label of. And basically, experimenters and is a well known cognitive effect is that um, a cognitive phenomenon is that. If you hear facts, whether they're right or wrong, later on, you will believe the, the, all the facts are right because you're familiar with the statements. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. So the, the experiments go like this. They have participants come in, and then they ask them to take a test on, uh, on a bunch of f uh, trivia facts, okay. you know, like... Um, Richard Gere put a, a rat up his butt. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? True, true or false. Right. And then they just, you know, they just, and some of the statements are true and some of them are not true. And some of, some of the not true statements are really not true. Yeah. You know, like scientists proved that the moon is made of cheese or something yeah. like it, it's, it gets that like far Straight, from true. Right. Then they come back in uh, later at some later date. And then they ask them, uh, which of these do you think are actual facts and which do you think are untrue? So kind of a similar test. Mm -hmm. And they find that uh, much more of the statements are seen as true, even the ones that are Interesting. false. Interesting. So they answer one way. Yeah. But later, they actually change what they remember. Like they well, think more things are true. Right. Because yeah. they there's a cognitive effect of familiarity. I've belie heard that. Believing something is true. And yeah. so what Alex Jones does... And I guess what a lot of people do, but I think whether Alex Jones and Donald Trump know they're doing it, they uh, using this effect, and I'm guessing they do know about it, yeah. it, it because they it's their job to know about these sorts of things. Um, they at least know that uh, that repeating something over and over and over again actually gets people to believe it. And, yeah. and I think that's what's happening, you know. So people who might be into Alex Jones because of 9-11 conspiracy stuff right. hear, hear about the sulfur-smelling Hillary Clinton. They hear that day in and day out. Emotionally, it starts to feel true. Yeah. Emotionally, it starts to feel true. And we are not governed by our, our, our prefrontal cortex. Uh, we are mostly governed by our emotional centers, yeah. by the rest of our brain. Uh, I can't prove that statement because it's, it's a bit of a nonsensical statement. But my point is, is that memory and f and the way we perceive something to be good or bad, the way we perceive something to be right or wrong, in in lieu of evidence, which is hard to find nowadays with all the stuff on the internet, we'll believe what our heart believes. Yeah. You know, you know, parents who are like, I'm not going to vaccine my child because my heart says that it's wrong. I, I yeah, it's like, I, I doesn't it do the autism thing? Yeah. Right. right. It's like, I, I've heard that a lot. It's, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Melissa McCarthy has said but, that many times. But remember times. that was disproven? I don't know. Was it? Yeah. I just heard it a lot. I've heard it a lot. I, th I think, yeah. you know, I think it's real. Um, and so uh, I think that's what he, one of his major pillars of success are, right. is that he repeats, repeats, right. stay interesting, uh, keep people engaged and repeat, repeat, you know, Y2K is right. coming. 
we're all going to die. You're, you need your survivalist stuff. Right. Y2K is coming. Uh, 9-11 is happening. They're, Guns are not part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, the Muslims are coming. Right. They're, they're coming to get you. Obama is a nefarious individual that yeah, wants yeah. to make our country a socialist communist country. I didn't country. hear that. I've heard that somewhere. You know, repeat, repeat, repeat. And here is the solution. Right. Buy my, keep listening so my ad revenues go up and buy this product because it right. will solve you. Listen, buy, listen, fact, listen. By, by the way, so um, what was the guy who was on Fox and then he he left and now he's got his right. Bra- Brave Network or whatever? I'm the- trying to remember that guy. Because I, I was, I, he seems very much like Alex Jones. He's a different sort. And, and he's only recently said, every now and then he'll say things that sound less crazy than everyone else of his peers. But he was at the forefront of the problem. Right. Uh, what was his name? You know, uh, come on. Anyway, oh my gosh. that guy. We're, we're not talking about Bill O'Reilly. We're talk- no, no, no. Talking about the guy who had the big. Uh, he would cry on his. Yeah, show. he had the chalkboard. The charts. Yeah, yes. Anyway, uh, Wait, why can't? I mean, I'm glad. Actually, I am so glad that I've forgotten his name. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm glad I don't remember the guy's name. But the point is this: uh, when he was on the air, he would start throwing out things, and he would draw his diagrams, and he would use words, and he would do this. Every time he presented, every time he presented. And so to your point, I remember getting into conversations, more like debates with people that would listen pretty fervently to this person. And they took so much of it for granted. Yeah. So you you didn't start arguing from like a, 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 a tabula rasa or the floor level and start trying to build arguments that you could prove or disprove you started from like the top of the mountain yeah and they had a mountain of assumptions yeah so you were like so you know a, 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 an argument would go something like well wh- why are you afraid of of obama it's like well because of the a- agenda 41 that they're going to put us in hobbit homes and they're going to take them to fema camps and you're like wait wait wait, wait 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 let's start with the first one but they had a mountain yeah. and they took them as fact right and we could say the same about any political ideology that propaganda is the basis of power for that, for whoever is seen as the leader or the propagator of that ideology. Um, we could say the same. I, I've heard people from all political angles uh, do the same problem, you know. I haven't. Oh, hey, there's man. a big difference between. Now, now, I think some research has looked into people on the right. Uh, might be guilty of it more. Well, I don't, uh, so but, but, but to I, your point, I, I'm not. I'm not talking about people on the right. I'm saying that there is an extreme cancerous version of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that that is um, yeah much more severe, yes. which is all um, borderlining on delusional. Yeah. Uh, the the last thing I'll say is that the illusory truth effect. Uh, we probably evolved it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hard to prove, but because it's. We're not computers, which people like to th- think of our brains as computers. We have random access memory and long-term memory, and we process information and da 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 da. And you know, I just always try to tell people our brain. If you took out, w- we don't usually eat brains of cows and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, so if you actually had a chance to like get your hands on an actual brain, it is pudding. Mm-hmm. It's hard pudding. And if you stick your finger through it, your finger just goes kind of right through it. You know what I mean? It's it's yeah. very soft, and it is not a computer. It is a it is a gelatinous <laughs> goo that somehow manages to produce consciousness in our minds. And and so uh, we are not. Have you looked at a chip lately? It's a little sliver of metal. <laughs> yeah. But still, it's like it it has like pathways and eh, dis- look at it, look dis- at our brain in a microscope. Discrete, uh, you know, uh, well. I, I, I There's have. There's pathways. <laughs> yeah, and they don't, but they're not. It doesn't see, look the same. But you see, actually, you're the exhibiting same. the problem because you are equating neurons with tr- with transistors. No. They, they are not transistors. I'm not doing that. What I'm trying to say is that just because it looks squishy doesn't mean it well, I'm, doesn't I, mean I'm saying something. true. And yeah. I say that because it's a fast way to get people to sure. emotionally understand that our brains are organic weird you know thing it's an organ like a yeah. heart or a liver it is not a perfect uh you know th- uh processing thing and so 
one of the things, so there's a lot of shortcuts is the point. Yeah. We, we have to, it, there's a lot of things that we can't think about all the time because if we did, we would, we would grind to a halt. And one of the things that we seemingly evolved was if something is familiar, it's probably right. Yeah. Like, um, it's, you know, I feel like it's familiar that the sun rises every day. Yeah. It's probably right. right. If that, that feels right. You know, uh, you know, the sun plummeting from the sky and like burning my, my wife, that doesn't feel familiar. Sure. That probably doesn't happen. You know what I mean? But, but honestly, like, look, I, I, I get where you're going with it, but it's no different than, uh, you might've seen the recent examples of where uh, they had a machine learning algorithm that could detect the cats from the, from the pictures, but then they showed it a picture that had no cat, but had the same kind of background that most of the cat photos tends to have. And it still said that there was a cat. And it's equivalent to when we see a visual illusion because we evolved a certain trick to quickly detect certain things. To, to say and then we, to, we glitch it. To say <laughs> that software can have a analogous uh, metaphor to a, a phenomenon that our, that we experience experientially is absolutely true. Yeah. To, to say that... Uh, I'm just saying that the metaphor... And the the belief system that says that our brains are basically computers uh, carries with it some benefit because it yeah. helps people understand certain processes, but it actually uh, can make people have too much confidence in our brains. Essentially, like you forget, like we are we are an organism, like a, a like an amoeba or a fish. You know, we are not perfect computers of information. We you know, we have all sorts of mistakes that we go through all the time. And, hey, and blue when, screen of death, my friend. Blue yeah. screen of death. And when we recognize that, we can better understand that we're vulnerable to things like the illusory truth effect. Yeah. The fact that it feels familiar or it feels true. And, you know, I'm going to say, yeah, that that's a true statement that, you know, the the moon is made of cheese. That that feels right to me, and it is right. And I'm going to put my money down on that one. Yeah. You know, th that l lacks the understanding that your memory is is a is contained in a squishy mess of goo. But but listen, it's it, it's funny. Like I, I want to be a little pedantic on this point. Just like I, I was just uh, watching this fascinating thing about this guy that uh, did his uh, PhD on delivering uh, delivering this vi using a virus to deliver some stuff to his uh, gut flora to reverse lacto lactose intolerance, which is amazing, right? It's amazing uh, bioengineering. And what, what he was talking about is, you know, like you have these, what you can do with the viruses is you can put a whole bunch of st stuff inside that has nothing to do with the virus. And to the body, it just still looks like a little virus crossing the cell membrane or whatever, right? And it's it's similar with our brains, like, Sometimes something comes in and it looks like a little virus, but inside there's something. And in this case, the example is that, oh, this looks like a, a bit of information. And our brain doesn't always register whether we should keep that as true or false. It's just a bit of information. And it, it accumulates. And later when we're being asked if something is true or false, we've accumulated a whole bunch of information. And our brain has a little a little uh, gimmick that it uses to try to figure out what, what they should do next. And at some point it's like, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Great. That's true. Right. And and it's these little, that's how you get a virus on a computer. Because you, you use this little packet of data that the computer is expecting. But inside, you put a whole bunch of garbage the computer wasn't expecting. And the computer's like, oh, yeah, this looks like friendly data. Oh, shit. You've taken over my system. Right. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know how you're disagreeing with me. No, no. I'm just being, I'm saying that we're more alike with computers than you want to be. Well, <laughs> metaphorically, you just use virus yes. with brain yeah. with computer. Yeah, it's it's very similar. Well, that does it for that episode <laughs> of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because... You deserve it. <laughs>